Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. I'm Tom Bliss. I'm the project manager here at Center for Healthy Sex. And we're happy to welcome today Vina Blanchard, surrogate therapist. And um, before we get started, I just want to let you know if you're joining us uh, online, you can always type in questions in the chat window to the left of your screen. And if you're joining us by phone, you can always email me questions at tom at centerforhealthysex.com and I'll type them in the chat window for you. Um, Center for Healthy Sex is a therapy center here in Los Angeles. We specialize in sex addiction, love addiction, and sex therapy. And we also offer several intensives. Feel free to check us out at centerforhealthysex.com. Um, and I want to draw your attention as it comes up to the holiday season to the book that Alexandra and I co-wrote, Mirror of Intimacy. And for um, Black Friday, we're going to offer a three-day sale, 40% off, so you can check that out on Amazon. So I'm really happy today to introduce you and, uh, and reintroduce you to people that are familiar with Vina's work, Vina Blanchard, who is the leading authority on surrogate therapy. Um, Vina completed her doctorate in human sexuality at the Institute for the Advanced Study of Human Sexuality in 2006. She's a professional member of the American Association of Sex Educators, Counselors, and Therapists, ASECT, and also the Society for the Scientific Study of Sexuality, Quad, Quad X, I think it's called, certified in both sex education and clinical sexology. Vina is currently on the board of directors of Quadex and president of the International Professional Surrogates Association, IPSA, as well as IPSA's senior trainer. She teaches undergrads and graduate students about human sexuality and sex therapy at universities and colleges throughout Southern California. And some of the places she taught at include UCLA, UCSD, San Diego State, University of Phoenix, and many more. She has a private count, sorry, private counseling practice in Los Angeles, and for over three decades there, she has enjoyed helping adults overcome difficulties with physical and emotional intimacy. You can visit her website at venablanchard.com. Vina, welcome. Thank you, Tom, and uh, welcome to everyone who's tuned in for the webinar or who will be looking at it online at a later time, or listening to it um, in a different way. I've uh, put a lot of information on the PowerPoint slides. So if you're not actually looking at uh, those, you might want to check out uh, YouTube and the places that uh, the uh, PowerPoint slides will be visible at another time. The focus of this talk is really uh, basic understanding about surrogate partner therapy, what it is, a little bit about what it isn't and whether or not it might be valuable uh, for you or your clients. And um, uh, the point of view that I'm going to share is really about the intimacy focused surrogate partner therapy. There are some people around the world who claim to uh, do something like surrogate therapy, but it's different than what I'm going to describe. Uh, sometimes it's just providing sexual services and uh, co-opting the name. And sometimes it's an attempt to provide genuine health and healing, but slightly different than this model. This model is the model from this International Professional Surrogates Association, which, as Tom said, I'm the president and senior trainer for that organization. So a little bit about the history and science of surrogate partner therapy. It really originated, the concept originated with William Masters and Virginia Johnson. They did research in the 1960s talking about uh, or looking at what happened physiologically inside the human body when it was uh, working its way through the sexual response cycle. They identified arousal and plateau and orgasm and a resolution phase. But they also identified that there were some people who either didn't make it through those phases or weren't satisfied with the experience that they had as they were trying to engage sexually. And in, uh, as a result of their initial research, they um, 
concluded that people who were more satisfied with their sexuality were experiencing uh, something slightly different than people who were unsatisfied, not just in how they made it through the physiological cycle, and, uh, but, and not just whether or not they reported satisfaction, but what they were experiencing in the middle of the process, where they were paying attention, what they were ignoring, and uh, where they were, uh, what their body was experiencing. And it occurred to them that it was might be possible to help teach the people who weren't satisfied with their sexuality to think about sex and focus on sexuality in a, uh, a different way, more like the people who were experiencing satisfaction. And so they uh, did about 11 years of research trying to see if they could help people become more satisfied and more functional in terms of getting through that uh, sexual arousal cycle. And, um, and they discovered that, lo and behold, you can, in fact, teach people to pay attention differently and paying attention differently changed their sense of satisfaction and how they made it through that cycle. So the major differences were that people who were um, having trouble were overly focused on performance and the mechanics of sexuality and people who were satisfied were focused on pleasure in the body and in the emotional connection that they had with their partners. And that you could give people this information, educate them a little bit about um, the sexual body and reproduction and work on their um, sort of ongoing relationship issues, resentments that had built up or poor communication skills, but that you also really had to focus on what they were thinking about, where they put their attention. And they called this process the sensate focus process, to focus on sensation was uh, what they considered most important. And then to also focus on the relationship and the connection with the partner. Um, they gave directed behavioral assignments to couples um, and by encouraging them to focus on the sensation in touch rather than on intercourse and orgasms and performance and how their partner might judge them. And also getting them to pay attention to the emotional connection that they had with their partners, it shifted the experience of the couples they were treating. Um, their point of view was that no sexual dysfunction exists for an individual, that it happens in relationship in and that the treatment was best uh, performed in uh, relationship, dealing with relationship issues, but also in partnered exercises. And um, they, they coined the term or the phrase that the relationship is the vehicle for change. That required having a cooperative partner to work with the client who was having difficulty. Usually, this, so the research was done in the late 50s and all through the 60s, and they worked with married couples primarily, and so it was usually a spouse. Um, they worked with female sexual dysfunction and male sexual dysfunction, um, and then they tried to figure out what to do with single people who didn't have a cooperative partner, no friend who was willing to go through a two-week intensive therapy program uh, in St. Louis, which is where they conducted their treatment. And um, it occurred to them that perhaps what they could do for single people, since their treatment program was so effective uh, for couples, was to provide a partner surrogate or a spouse surrogate to go through the program with the person who was having sexual disorder. And um, because they were scientists and they were planning to publish this, they looked at the effectiveness of their treatment program for couples, which they found to be at about 80% success for people who went through their program, regardless of the sexual dysfunction, it was approximately 80%. And that the people who went through with the partner surrogates were equally or more uh, effective, or the treatment was equally or more effective 
with a partner surrogate as it was with a spouse. This is really important to understand. They were using the same treatment methodology. They were using the same uh, concepts. They were simply uh, substituting uh, the permanent or committed partner with, for, and using a trained person uh, who would form a brand new relationship with the client. Um, there are other people who have done research uh, into the concept of surrogate partner therapy right around the same time that Masters and Johnson were doing their research. Martin Cole was doing similar research in uh, the United Kingdom and um, people here in California, Bernie Applebaum, Bernie Zilbergeld, Barbara Roberts, all uh, uh, clinicians who were working with clients using what they had learned from Masters and Johnson, and uh, but expanding on the concept of surrogate partner therapy, finding that it was also successful. Masters and Johnson had, or actually Bill Masters primarily, had a point of view that while male clients would be able to successfully partner with a female surrogate partner, that um, the uh, that it wasn't he believed possible for a female client to form enough of a connection with a male surrogate partner in just two weeks in order to be effective. And so they didn't train male surrogate partners. However, uh, the California therapists immediately began training male surrogate partners. They didn't have the same prejudice or point of view that Bill Masters had, and they found that male surrogate partners were as effective in working with female clients. Um, then sort of more recently in about 2007, 2009, there was some research done in Israel by an author by the name, last name Ben Zion and his colleague Ronit Alani and some of their other colleagues. Working with female clients partnered with male surrogate partners and comparing their treatment inside the clinic with uh, their treatment of married couples or partnered committed couples. They were working in this case on the specific female sexual dysfunction of vaginismus, which is the anxiety disorder where there's a spastic contraction of the vaginal muscles uh, that makes penetration very painful, sometimes impossible. And what they found was that the female clients working with male surrogate partners had better treatment outcomes than women working with spouses. Um, the uh, couples uh, often dropped out of therapy, uh, often leading to divorce or separation, uh, whereas every single one of the female surrogate partners working with a male surrogate partner went entirely through the process and had uh, success in that program. It's important then to keep in mind that surrogate partner therapy is an extension of traditional sex therapy and the common components of sec all sex therapy treatment are that there's a talk therapy part of the treatment and there's an experiential learning part of the treatment. Um, talk therapy is your traditional psychotherapy, uh, working on deep psychological issues, issues uh, left over from childhood, traumatic experiences, um, and or lack of education uh, about sexuality, poor modeling from parents and uh, the culture at large, working on couples counseling, the um, issues between spouses and or partners, and dealing with the uh, sort of what therapists might call uh, cognitive distortions and wrong thinking about relationships and sexuality. And uh, where these, as the experiential learning part of sex therapy is teaching basic concepts of relaxation, good communication skills, mindful awareness of the body that we call sensate focus, this desensitization, meaning if there's a thing you feel very anxious about, we can help you get more comfortable about that thing in the same way that you help people overcome uh, fears of flying or driving or elevators or snakes or any of the other things people might be uh, frightened about. You work in a very gradual way to help them get more and more 
comfortable with something that's close to but not exactly like the thing they're afraid of. And there are people who have sexual disorders that are really phobia and anxiety based. Um, and so uh, there's a desensitization process to reduce the amount of anxiety triggered uh, by these uh, experiences, whether it's nudity or expressing your feelings or asking someone out. Uh, and this desensitization is paired with a behavioral therapy concept of successive approximation. And those are basically the same ideas. You get closer to this thing you ultimately want, but you do it in such little steps that it doesn't raise the anxiety too high and uh, the person begins to shift their expectation and anticipations from negative anticipation and anticipatory anxiety to an anticipation anticipation of relaxation and comfort and connection. Um, and, and another important part of this experiential learning that happens in sex therapy is that um, people are given these concrete homework exercises to do with their partners at home. Additionally, clients who might have um, a medical cause for their sexual disorders or their uh, relationship difficulties, beside, whether it's psychiatric or physiologic, will be sent for an evaluation from a medical team. Um, so these common features of most sex therapy, which includes surrogate partner therapy, um, combine in uh, the surrogate partner therapy. It's not different from sex therapy in most ways. And so all the research that tells us that sex therapy is effective, in fact, highly effective, also tells us that using those same methods, surrogate partner therapy is likely to be highly effective uh, since both uh, the Israeli research and the uh, research here in the US by Masters and Johnson confirm like almost 40 years apart that um, surrogate partner therapy is as effective as couples treatment when using the same methods. So they said the relationship is the vehicle for change, but what if the client doesn't have a relationship? And that's where they came up with the idea of a trained surrogate partner. So you have here a uh, client with the green face who seeks treatment with a therapist and the therapist then refers that client at some point to a surrogate partner. And they then become a therapeutic triad, a team working together to resolve the client's difficulties. The client brings not only the problem, but all their self-awareness, their insight, their response to the treatment program. The therapist brings all their psychotherapy training and if they're working with a private partner, then they're bringing the partner's commitments and, but also sometimes the partner's uh, complaints and personal needs and their own difficulties. When they're working with a surrogate partner, um, the surrogate partner leaves a lot of their personal challenges at home and uh, is um, in this sense, an emotionally committed cooperative partner but there isn't an existing relationship between surrogate and client. And so the initial stages of the work are designed to help establish a relationship. The client first establishes a relationship with the therapist. The therapist assesses the client's problems and helps decide what's in the client's best interest, whether um, a 1495 paperback is gonna help solve their problem, or deep psychotherapy for 14 years is necessary, or at some point, whether those things are not working, uh, perhaps working with a surrogate partner might be more useful uh, way to address the client's difficulties. If the therapist believes that, they might then contact the surrogate partner and discuss the case, and the surrogate will also weigh in about whether or not it seems like an appropriate client for surrogate partner therapy. The triad initially meets in the therapist's office. That's a place the client is comfortable and familiar. The therapist then gets to observe the interaction uh, between, the between the surrogate and the 
client and this is an information gathering session. They're having a conversation about the client's concerns about their goals for therapy. The surrogate is explaining surrogate partner therapy, who or she, who she or he is and how they work. And the client and surrogate are making a decision about whether or not to move forward with the therapy. If the client moves forward, then they will typically see the surrogate partner in the surrogate's workspace and continue to see the therapist for regular sessions. And then the therapist and the surrogate partner will talk on the phone or exchange emails or uh, meet in person so that it becomes this triadic relationship. But the meetings are usually in dyads. Um, each two members having their own interaction and then reporting to the third person about what they experienced. The surrogate partner typically talks with the therapist after every session the surrogate has with the client. And those conversations are both reporting what happened and making plans for how best to address the client's issues and their reactions to the treatment process. The therapist also meets with the client to get a report about the client's experience and reports back to the surrogate partner what uh, the client is experiencing, not to do the work for the client of developing the relationship, but rather to confirm that the surrogate's perceptions of the client are accurate and that the therapist is still in agreement about how to uh, structure the next session. So this is uh, an open, honest communication between therapist, surrogate, partner, and client. Very important that it be consistent, open communication and regular contact. Um, the surrogate and client work together uh, through a course of treatment. I'm gonna talk about the arc of that treatment in a minute. Um, but at some point, uh, then they make a decision that the work between the surrogate and the client has met the goals, the revised goals, and the client is ready to move on uh, from that relationship. Usually the client continues with their therapist, the therapist helping them process the closure of this relationship and helping them to generalize uh, what they learned into the next relationship. There are some unique features of surrogate partner therapy uh, that are worth noting. And these are often the things that give people concern or uh, raise questions, create myths about surrogate partner therapy. And it, they mostly center around the fact that the relationship between the surrogate and the client becomes the crucible for change. It becomes the vehicle in which client can practice new skills, develop new understandings, learn to be different in the interaction. Uh, it is what they are often doing, what a couple would do at home um, in their homework part of the sex therapy treatment. This clinical relationship then is a, a crucible. It is the place that stimulates change, both because of the exercises and because of the human connection uh, between the surrogate and the client. There's an emphasis on emotional connection, helping the client to be able to connect with a partner, not a pretend connection, a real connection, real human beings getting to know each other, real human beings um, experiencing mm, enjoyment, but also frustrations and working through conflict, working on uh, helping the client to breathe and relax during the uh, experience of anxiety, practicing relaxation together, but also talking about how it feels to be doing this process together and to be real about the real feelings that are emerging, whatever they might be. And there's touch between the surrogate and the client. That touch is initially non-sexual, it's nurturing, but because there is an emphasis on the experiential learning and the learning is in the area of physical and emotional intimacy, then there is 
the need to engage in some degree of physical intimacy to help identify the client's difficulties and help them develop new skills so they move beyond those difficulties. And it's these areas, the emotional intimacy and the physical intimacy that tend to stir up people's anxieties about surrogate partner therapy. The concern about if there are real feelings, will somebody's feelings get hurt is common. Or if, there are, if you are outside the traditional boundaries of psychotherapy, are there any boundaries? There are boundaries. They're important for the client's health and well-being and for uh, making the process uh, beneficial to the client. Another area of uh, interest and uniqueness is that there's nudity often in the uh, surrogate and client sessions. And additionally, there not only is eroticism or the potential for it, but there's a focus or uh, attention to the potential for eroticism and the lacking of eroticism. But by eroticism, I don't just mean sex behaviors. I mean the feelings of joy, attachment, um, connection, enthusiasm, pleasure, um, and a focus on pleasure instead of performance, a focus on arousal. Where is arousal? What sparks arousal? What inhibits arousal? This is a chance to learn experientially about those things and then resolve them so that the client can carry forward into their future healthy relationships, the capacity for emotional connection and physical connection and eroticism. Some clients have difficulties way before uh, the erotic arena. They don't know how to ask someone for a date or talk in public. They have uh, social anxiety. And surrogate partner therapy might also address those social skills issues and social anxiety issues. And then finally, there is a planned closure. There will be a conclusion to the treatment, and, um, and that's going to be a very conscious, deliberate part of the relationship, an acknowledged part of the relationship. There's closure in every relationship. People die, we change, there's divorce, but we rarely make it a conscious part of uh, the relationship from beginning to end. There are standard ways in which surrogate partner therapy is practiced. The therapist and surrogate generally have collaborative private practices, meaning they each have a separate office. They see the client in separate places, but they consult with each other in between sessions. Typically, that's once a week, although it might be uh, that for uh, a variety of reasons, the therapist and client and surrogate agree that working more intensively might be useful. If the client lives in the middle of the US, uh, there often is not surrogate partner therapy available to them, no surrogate partners in their state, much less their city. And so they might travel to another part of the world to work with a therapist and surrogate team. And usually people need to take uh, time off work and um, and so they will you often see the therapist and the surrogate every single day for uh, a period of a week to two weeks uh, and sometimes to return for uh, additional intensive therapy sessions. Um, it's also true that sometimes people, while they have a surrogate in their state, they don't have anyone in their town and they have to drive so far that they'd rather do longer sessions and uh, meet two days in a row. Um, there are a few places such as in Israel where there are clinics and the client sees the surrogate partner in the clinic at that they also see the therapist uh, just at different minutes. Um, there are four primary functions of the surrogate client relationship. And these are themes threads that run throughout the therapy from beginning to end, regardless of whether it's weekly or intensive therapy. And that is that every session and every activity is simultaneously diagnostic. It provides an assessment of the client's skills and abilities and also helps identify where their challenges are. 
um, and the every single in activity between the surrogate and client is also an opportunity for skill building, whether those are the emotional skills of knowing what you're feeling or the communication skills of expressing those feelings or the intersection of those two, whether it's the skill of uh, focusing attention in the present rather than being worried about the past or the future, whether it's the skill of, uh, of identifying anxiety and, and choosing to reduce the anxiety with breathing and relaxation and communication and connection. And simultaneously, this is also a develop a model for developing healthy relationships. The process, which we're going to be talking about, um, starts in such a gentle and safe way and is designed to build um, the relationship uh, in conscious and uh, uh, sort of healthy ways, developing emotional intimacy and uh, self-awareness uh, and the client being able to set boundaries, to express their needs, um, and to learn to be respectful of uh, the other person, in this case, a surrogate partner. If they were working with uh, their private partner, they would be working on these same relationship skills, um, but they might not be have, getting the sense that this is how you build a healthy relationship. So these things are pretty easy to describe how doing an exercise and the client's report explains that or helps us understand whether they're already good at communication or have difficulties, already good at being present or have difficulties, and um, how it might help build skills and how it might build a model for a healthy relationship. The part that's harder to make sense of for people who haven't been through the experience is that there is a transformational process that's taking place, the development of the person of the client. And it happens as a result of this intimate relationship, this budding, honest, authentic relationship. And um, e even though uh, they're together for a reason to help the client learn and grow, and it's time limited during the interactions, the uh, it's two real people having this experience. You can't stop being a real person and paying attention to that um, helps transform the experience into something that is more meaningful and deeper uh, and more lasting for the client. So it's a common myth or misunderstanding that this is a mechanical process um, where a person is just put through a series of exercises, that's completely not uh, what's happening. The client is participating in decision-making, the client is reporting their experience, and the surrogate is also reporting because how the surrogate partner experiences the client gives us information about how people experience the client. And it's helpful for the therapist and surrogate to talk to each other about how they're experiencing this particular client. So I said there's an arc to the relationship and um, it's important to understand that the relationship with a surrogate partner starts at what we might think of as the most basic developmental level at building trust and providing nurturing and developing the most basic skills and this trust and nurturing and basic skills provides this really broad, solid, healthy foundation for then developing the rest of the relationship. Clients enter therapy uh, with hope and faith, but trust is born of knowledge and the repeated experience of another person knowing who they are tells us what we can trust them to be. And so the surrogate and client need time to develop a relationship to know each other in order to have genuine trust in each other. The initial touching exercises are all about building basic skills like 
the client is touching an object and feeling the texture and temperature, sensing it, tuning into the experience in his or her own body. And that's the beginning of developing this mindful awareness of sensation or the focus on sensation. Um, the initial touching between surrogate and client is divided into one active partner and one passive partner. And that allows us to discover whether the client has difficulty receiving or in being the creator of their own experience. But the arena of this is done in non-sexual, non-threatening kinds of touch. So it might be hand on hand if the client can tolerate that level of intimacy. If they can't, it might be something like, as I said, it would begin with objects, but it might move on to something like touching of hands and eventually something much more intimate challenging for some people, easy for others, the touching of face or the touching of feet. Notice these are not traditionally sexual. If a client experienced these as a highly charged sexual body part, then they wouldn't be included in the early stages because we're creating a environment of warmth and safety and uh, familiarity and trust much as we do for our infants and small children to hold and nurture them. And from that place of safety, then they eventually grow to be able to be the creators of their own world. The second stage of the treatment is now more about whole body acceptance and sensuality and a deepening level of emotional intimacy. And while my slide here says that it's about sensuality and intimacy, I've taken to thinking about it much more as the stage of whole person and whole body acceptance. Um, and at this, the transition between stage one and stage two is that uh, we're also uh, possibly including nudity or partial nudity. So it might be a caress of the back or the back of the body without a shirt um, and uh, addressing body image issues uh, that are inhibiting for the client and, um, and addressing whatever emotional issues come up with this increased level of intimacy. Remember the client is always going back and processing each session with their therapist, talking about what emotional material came up what was confusing, what made sense, what they enjoyed, how they're feeling about the surrogate partner, as well as talking about, you know, their feelings about their parents and their childhood and their boss and the rest of their life. Stage three is uh, where we then begin to address mutuality and eroticism. And um, up until now, all the touching has been divided into one passive and one active partner. And now it's uh, the client's learning about how to be active at the same time that their partner is active and to still maintain relaxation and trust and comfort. When you think about a client who may have been uh, traumatized in the past, this level of intimacy would be terrifying uh, if they, we hadn't built the first couple of stages of uh, trust and sensuality that had nothing to do with sexuality and eroticism. And then in this third stage is where we can address specific sexual dysfunctions directly if they exist. And the fourth stage is where we work on the conscious closure. Um, and um, help celebrate all the growth and learning, but uh, also turn the client towards the future and uh, how they're going to apply what they've learned in the next stage of their life. I want to talk for a moment about the role of the supervising therapist. As I said, the therapist um, needs to assess the client's appropriateness for this form of therapy. Are they ready? And even before that, is this even a kind of therapy that they need? 
The therapist also is evaluating the surrogate partner and deciding who's the appropriate person for the client to work with. Clients, of course, have a right to uh, decline to work with a surrogate partner for some reason, but um, the therapist is the one that does the initial uh, search for the surrogate partner and the initial screening. The therapist also has a job to maintain an objective overview, talking to both the, ther the surrogate and the client, and helping to keep, keep a sense of that the work is on track and when there are problems to help the surrogate and client resolve them. Um, the, inevitably, when people are engaging in change, there will be resistance and defensiveness um, defending the way they used to be or their belief systems um, and just naturally pushing away the discomfort of uh, a change process. Uh, and it's the therapist's job to uh, be able to talk to the client about that resistance and the, um, the feelings of reluctance to move forward. And what would the consequences be if they, in fact, changed the way they were uh, to something um, that might provide them the uh, or meet the goals of their therapy, but um, be uncomfortable along the way. So the therapist actually has a job of helping to foster a strong, healthy relationship between the surrogate and client and to help identify when there are problems in that relationship. Similarly, the, the surrogate partner is helping to pay attention to if the client's having trouble in his or her relationship with the therapist and directing um, uh, them back to talk with the therapist about the difficulty they're having and use the relationship with the therapist as a vehicle for growth and change. Um, and, then, and then ultimately, it's the therapist's job to help the client process the feelings that they have about uh, ending the relationship with the surrogate and uh, helping them to shape their future without the surrogate. The kinds of clients who are appropriate for surrogate partner therapy are adults who don't have a partner to work with, who are experiencing a specific sexual dysfunction. For men, that might include rapid ejaculation, delayed orgasm, erection difficulties, pain with intercourse or sexuality, sexual fears and diversion, social phobias. Um, they might have a lack of experience and feel shame about that. Truth is, female clients might have these social phobias and uh, uh, have delayed the beginning of their sex lives and now feel out of sync with their peers and need some assistance. They might have this vaginismus, the contraction of vaginal muscles or pain uh, from a number of causes, whether it's fear or it's a physiologic cause. A common concern for women is the inability to have orgasms with partners. Some have never had orgasms at all. Uh, and um, many females and some men suffer from body dysmorphic disorder, this distorted idea about what they look like. But also sometimes a really honest assessment of how they look and recognition that it's outside the cultural norm in some way, whether it's from um, an injury or surgery or weight issues um, or uh, skin tone. I had one client once who thought that he was an unacceptable male because he was so pale. Uh, he had pale white skin and he thought that was um, a reason to not partner and wanting to overcome that feeling was his main reason for being in therapy. Some people have adjustment issues to a recently acquired disability or medical condition. Um, it's quite common, and I would say the majority of clients coming for sort of maybe 50% of clients seeking surrogate partner therapy fall into that midlife virgin category. But uh, um, the other large categories have to do with being abused and traumatized in childhood or afterwards. So victims of rape, child molestation, or profound neglect by parents um, and uh, lack of 
experience building trust or having trust with caregivers of any kind. Sometimes people have uh, a discomfort with their own sexual orientation or gender, and there's some benefits to working with a surrogate partner so they can explore something uh, without engaging uh, in a dishonest way with a partner in the world. People who aren't ready might be uh, people who have profound mental illnesses or um, drug and alcohol addiction and uh, or are too newly in recovery because they aren't stable enough to tolerate the process. Um, selecting a surrogate partner, one of the best ways is to go to the International Professional Surrogates Association. They have a referral network. Um, you want to make sure that the surrogate is well trained certified by IPSA, that they're intelligent and nurturing and compassionate, um, warm people um, open to working on their own issues should those emerge. Um, the IPSA website is listed here. I'm going to uh, uh, say it out loud for people who aren't seeing it. It's surrogatetherapy.org or uh, a short URL is also ipsa.us. So that's S-U-R-R-O-G-A-T-E-T-H-E-R-A-P-Y dot O-R-G. They have a code of ethics and offer training and certification and uh, have a referrals coordinator who can help uh, people find their way to therapists who work with surrogates or surrogates who uh, uh, are available in their community if it's a therapist. One of the major questions about surrogate partner therapy is, is this legal? And that usually arises out of the, uh, because it's a really unique treatment form that does have touch and nudity and emotions that are not typical in psychotherapy. As far as we know, there are no laws prohibiting surrogate partner therapy or the referral to surrogates. Um, and neither are there licensing boards that restrict therapists being involved in surrogate partner therapy. Uh, we know for sure in California, the licensing boards are well aware of surrogate partner therapy, as our district attorneys, our current uh, uh, California attorney general uh, was on record when she was a district attorney in the Bay Area, uh, saying that surrogate partner therapy was not illegal. I think the other ethical question that needs to be asked is what is in the client's best interest? Do they in fact need this treatment? And if they do, is it ethical even to withhold it from them? Um, and is there another treatment method that might be equally beneficial? Not every client is comfortable working with a surrogate partner. It can be expensive to pay the therapist's fee and the surrogate partner's fees. Um, and uh, some clients will save for a couple of years to be able to do this treatment program. Surrogates fees tend to be very similar to therapist fees in a given community. Um, and in California, I think the average is about $150 a, an hour. Um, there are some unique challenges for therapists who are working with surrogate partners and uh, supervising this. And one of it's just that it's an unfamiliar area where they don't have previous training and skill. There's a YouTube video of me uh, giving a lecture at the American Association of Sex Educators, Counselors, and Therapists conference a couple of years ago, and it's designed specifically for supervising therapists. I think you can get to it off the IPSA website. Um, I should be able to say that it's on my website, but I actually think it isn't. Um, you might be able to get to it just by Googling it. I haven't tried that, um, but if you write to me, uh, if you weren't able to find it, I'm happy to uh, send you to that video, which is an hour long presentation uh, really aimed at therapists for how to think about supervising surrogate partner therapy. Um, we have to refer our clients out for all kinds of treatment we can't provide, whether it's specific religious counseling or medical evaluation. And sometimes it's to refer to a surrogate partner for the experiential learning they cannot get in the psychotherapy process. And, um, and if a therapist 
knows that this is a good treatment for the client, but they aren't comfortable uh, participating, then it might be that the most ethical referral is actually to refer the client to a different therapist who is willing to supervise the surrogate partner therapy. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to skip this, but just to say that there are a lot of uh, therapy presentation, or there are a lot of theoretical models that are um, uh, sort of the foundation for surrogate partner therapy, uh, and um, that the structure of the sessions is very similar to. Um, what you would expect in any human interaction, a conversation, some activity, and some conversation. Those conversations are also skill building and diagnostic and a model for relationship. The experiential learning is more designed to be skill building and this gradual exposure to things that are anxiety provoking. And then the uh, consultation with the therapist that the surrogate and client do is this processing of the experience that then leads into the next uh, session. There, um, I talked about most of this uh, on this slide about the development of both physical, cognitive, and emotional skills. And um, some of that includes taking risks uh, and exposing more of yourself. Um, there are tremendous benefits that come from the Sensate Focus process. This is a slide about the uh, process itself. Uh, the first couple of exercises are what I would call stage one, the nurturing, trust building stage. Back caress, front caress are more the whole body acceptance. And then the uh, last exercises are really about this uh, third stage of the work that's more about addressing specific problems with sexuality and eroticism. I want to read this little quote from me because I thought I, I thought I said it right, that for many clients, wounding in early relationships results in withdrawal from intimacy and sabotaging of future relationship opportunities, defending against their fear of dependence, exposure, or loss. These clients deprive themselves of the maturational experiences and transformational influences of intimate, authentic relationships. Intimacy-focused surrogate partner therapy has the capacity to facilitate deep healing and self-actualization for such clients. So uh, I'm happy to take questions if there are any. I haven't seen any pop up. Um, I haven't given you a chance, but we have uh, a little time left if anyone has questions. You will have access to the PowerPoint uh, uh, from me, write to uh, me at vina at vinablanchard.com or give me, uh, you can text me, um, although it's a little easier if you send email because I'll be sending it uh, through email to you. Um, and um, I don't know if, I believe this webinar remains available uh, through the Center for Healthy Sex and uh, so the PowerPoint will be available that way. Yes, our, the recording will be uploaded to youtube.com, Center for Healthy Sex. And I'm going to open up our phone line too, so people can talk. And let me just do that for one, it'll just take a second. Um, All attendees are muted and may unmute themselves by pressing star six. Okay, so if you'd like to ask a question, uh, just press, press star six. Thank you. So someone, uh, you know, offered a thanks and, and you're welcome. This was a fast run through of a, a pretty complicated process. And um, if you have additional questions, if you have specific clients that you think this might be useful for, or if you think it might be valuable for you, 
um, you can contact me directly. My phone number is 760-415-4220. Uh, you can text or leave a message there, and I'm happy to answer the question. Uh, and the International Professional Surrogates Association, you can contact uh, through their website. There are a bunch of uh, links to uh, reach out to the referrals person, or you can just write to referrals at surrogatetherapy.org. Um, and um, someone asks if uh, there's a professional book on the subject. There really isn't. There are articles, but not an entire book on the subject. There have been a couple of uh, um, anecdotal books written by surrogates or a collection of uh, commentary by surrogates. Um, Women of the Light has an article by Barbara Roberts, who was a therapist who uh, was one of the founders of IPSA and uh, trained a bunch of surrogates. And there's an article by her. The International Professional Surrogates Association on their website has a list uh, bibliography. I think the uh, on the nav bar up at the top, it says something like library or resources. And you check there and there's a, a bibliography of uh, virtually every uh, professional article that's been written about surrogate partner therapy. And there are also, uh, you know, a bunch of popular articles that we've screened. Um, um, someone's asking if they uh, can get listed uh, as a certified sex therapist who works with a surrogate partner. And um, IPSA doesn't list us uh, therapists, but they do refer to surrogates. And if you have worked with surrogate partners, I mean, sorry, they do refer to therapists who work with surrogate partners. So if, uh, Roger, if you've worked with surrogate partners, um, then you can uh, uh, join IPSA and get referrals uh, through the IPSA referral network. And by the way, I just trained somebody up in your area. So call me and we'll talk about her. Uh, and somebody else is um, how this could be applied to forensic psychosexology, um, and where we explore dysfunction that often leads to criminality. Um, and I'm not sure how this could be um, applicable for forensic psychosexology, um, honestly. Um, there have been some surrogate partners who have worked with clients who were registered sex offenders and um, or who were uh, uh, looking to develop their uh, sexuality in new ways. And while we know that uh, completely extinguishing uh, a certain sexual interest is extremely difficult. It isn't difficult to develop additional interests and have alternative ways of expressing our sexuality. Um, and, you know, that's the premise of all sex therapy is that we can learn and grow and develop ourselves sexually and uh, add to our sexuality and let go of bad habits or bad thinking or uh, troublesome turn-ons in one way or another. I have two questions. Is someone hearing me? Yes. Um, I can hear you. And, okay. Uh, one of them is um, what about the sexually addicted client? Is Are there any additional considerations uh, for a client who might be sexually addicted and highly arousing? Uh, ability to be highly aroused. Um, and the other is, um, does the surrogate also um, utilize nudity? Uh, is the surrogate uh, sometimes fully nude? And like I noticed that um, breasts are not touched in the front touch, but it sounds like the front might be exposed and uh, a female's breasts uh, as a surrogate might be exposed. I'll stop so I'm going to get some more complicated. 
Let me answer your second question first, because that's the quicker answer. Because it is a developing relationship, there's mutuality at every stage. So when they're touching hands, the surrogate is touching the client's hands, and then the client touches the surrogate's hands. And that's true at the stage of nudity and whole body touching as well, that the surrogate partner will, in some cases, uh, disrobe with the client. Um, and um, it's tremendously powerful, by the way, for people with um, uh, body image issues to see themselves standing in the mirror next to a real person who looks human, not a magazine image, but a real person who is uh, naked with them and vulnerable with them. And I think it's one of the most powerful parts of surrogate partner therapy that the surrogate is emotionally and physically vulnerable with the client or, you know, developing that alongside the client. Actually, I think my experience has been that this is an extremely effective treatment method for people who self-identify or are diagnosed as having sex addiction because the, we're developing these other skills, this emotional capacity for contact and connection and closeness. Um, and I believe that um, that's an essential part of being able to move beyond this addic addictive, depersonalizing uh, approach to sexuality. Um, and um, of course, you know, it might not be viewed in a positive way in, at certain stages of the treatment process. The therapist has to help evaluate when the client is ready to now uh, develop the uh, more sophisticated and mature kind of emotional connection um, and build their eroticism based on that rather than on porn or dissociation. Um, it's not designed specifically for people with sex addiction, but it's very applicable. And um, it, the process is necessarily slow with a lot of our clients. If they were able to move quickly through the treatment process, they would have done that and not needed surrogate partner therapy. So many of our clients are uh, clients with uh, greater difficulties uh, that need the deeper, longer, slower um, yeah, treatment process. Um, Thanks. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. I see that we're approaching the end of the hour, um, and I appreciate this opportunity to uh, chat with all of you. And I will take a look at the questions I didn't have a chance to get to. And um, if you want to text me uh, your uh, name, I will uh, try and respond to you personally instead of uh, in this hour. Um, and um, again, I think it's the Center for Healthy Sex is doing the archiving. I was able to access some through uh, YouTube, and I think it's possible uh, that uh, Tom will chime in again and say where people can access this. Yes. Hi. Thank you so much for, being a for your webinar today. Um, and unfortunately, my screen, I'm looking at it frozen, so hopefully you're all hearing me. Um, the talk will be archived on YouTube, and you can do just a basic search for uh, Center for Healthy Sex on YouTube, or go directly to youtube.com backslash Center for Healthy Sex. Again, thank you so much, Vina. You can contact Vina for any questions or to get um, the handout at any time, the PowerPoint. And um, I'd like to all invite you to our next webinar, December 9th, with Paul Johannes. Johanna, I was going to do this right. I'm going to have to ask him how he says his name. Johanna Deuce? Well, you can see this on our website. And uh, he will be talking about his, he'll give a presentation based on his book, The Guide to Getting It On. All which right. is a great book. Which is, is a it? great book. Do you know, do you know mm -hmm. how to say his last name? Uh, I don't, I, I guess. So I, I say it Joanides, but I don't really know how he pronounces it. Okay, thanks, Rina. And again, thank you so much. All of you, thank you for joining us and have a wonderful weekend. Bye.